On the 13th of November 1970, South Korean garment worker Chun Tae-il, after trying to organise for better conditions, poured kerosene on his body and set himself on fire in front of Seoul's peace market. After his death, his mother Lee so Sun dedicated her life to continuing his work, organising amongst garment workers under the brutal US-backed military dictatorship. This is Working Class History. Hi, and welcome back to the Working Class History Podcast, which is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Our supporters fund our work and in return get exclusive early access to podcast episodes, bonus episodes, free and discounted merchandise and other content. The more support we have, the more frequently we'll be able to release episodes. So join us or find out more at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Link in the show notes. Today's the first of several episodes we have planned on Korean history. Specifically, we're going to be looking at struggles in the South Korean garment industry, and in particular at the lives of Chun Tae-il and Lee So-sun, two really central figures in the workers' movement, one of whom is very well known in South Korea, and one of whom is not so well known, for reasons we'll explore later. I'd like to thank my friend Stephen from Seoul for suggesting this as a subject for an episode. When I was in South Korea a couple of years ago, Stephen also very kindly showed me around and translated a new exhibition space dedicated to Chun Tae-il. As a content note, this episode contains descriptions and discussion of suicide, as well as a few brief mentions of sexual violence. We are very pleased to be joined by Rachel Min Park, a member of the Hearn Coalition. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, My name is Rachel, and I currently work as a freelance researcher, translator, and film critic. Broadly speaking, I research modern Korean history with a focus on cultural representations of communist women during the Korean War, and immediate post-war period. And I also wanted to um, thank my friend Hambit Lee, who introduced me to a lot of the organizations doing important work in the labor rights movements currently in South Korea. Before we got into the interview, Rachel wanted to make a bit of a disclaimer, which I hoped wouldn't really be necessary, but we're including it just in case anyone would make the mistake of conflating one individual of being representative of a much larger group. So um, before we begin, I just wanted to note that I am Korean American, um, born and raised in the U.S., though I did recently live in South Korea for about three years for grad school. I wanted to mention this because I think there is a general trend in media where Korean Americans can sometimes be presented as experts on Korean culture and society solely by merit of the shared ethnicity. But there's a huge difference between the two countries, and I think it's really important to recognize all the commensurate privileges that I've had as a U.S. citizen, such as fluency in English or access to a lot of these institutions. So in that sense, I do want to emphasize that I don't speak for all Koreans, nor should I be taken as a kind of representative or authoritative voice of any kind on behalf of Koreans as well. Before we get going, we just need to give a super brief bit of background on Korean history. The events are complicated, so to fit this into the available time, we're going to have to be simplifying a lot in order to explain the necessary context. So don't take this as a full and definitive history. As always, we've got links to sources and further reading in the show notes. In 1910, Korea was annexed by the Japanese Empire, who set up a brutal colonial regime and attempted to eradicate Korean history, culture and language. So they banned the Korean language, burned books and historical archives, enforced Japanese Shinto religious practices... They implemented forced labour for hundreds of thousands of Korean workers and sexually enslaved large numbers of Korean women for the benefit of Japanese soldiers, people commonly referred to as comfort women. Now, this wasn't something that was passively accepted by Korean people, especially poor and working class people, although some Koreans, including the ancestors of many rich and powerful Koreans today, became extremely wealthy by collaborating with the Japanese. They developed a militant and powerful anti-colonial movement, which fought against Japanese forces in Korea, as well as in Manchuria, northeast China, and the Japanese mainland. In 1945, Japan was eventually defeated at the end of World War II, and Korea was then occupied by Allied forces, with Soviet troops taking over the part of the country north of the 38th parallel, and US troops taking over the south. They agreed, alongside Britain and China, to a five-year trusteeship leading to independence. Some in the Korean independence movements demanded immediate independence, but the influential Korean Communist Party, which was allied with the Soviet Union, supported the trusteeship arrangement, 
People's Committees set up across the Korean Peninsula then established a provisional government, the People's Republic of Korea, in September 1945, which had a progressive 27-point program including things like land redistribution, rent controls, nationalisation of major industries, guaranteed human rights, universal suffrage, equality for women, a ban on child labour, workers' rights and an eight-hour maximum working day. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this was not to the liking of US authorities, who soon disbanded and outlawed it and instead set up a military dictatorship in the South, staffed by former Japanese colonial officials. After a huge public outcry, they replaced some Japanese bureaucrats with US bureaucrats, but instead enlisted the deposed Japanese officials as advisers. Workers and peasants rose up against the regime in 1946 and were violently repressed. Meanwhile, in the North, land reforms did begin to take place, with land owned by Japanese colonists and wealthy Korean collaborators generally peacefully and equitably redistributed among poor farmers and the former owners, although many of the former owners decided to instead leave for the South rather than live on equal terms with their neighbours. US-Soviet relations deteriorated rapidly after the end of World War II, as the Cold War began to heat up. In 1947, the USSR proposed that both its troops and US troops leave, allowing Koreans to form their own government. This was rejected by the US, presumably because they feared the election would be won by communists or left nationalists. The United Nations, or UN, then decided it would supervise elections. But the USSR didn't trust it to hold fair elections, and so they boycotted the decision, meaning that the elections only got held in the US-occupied southern zone. Korean workers began huge strikes against the plan, fearing it would lead to the country being divided, and residents on Jeju Island rebelled as well. These were violently crushed by the South Korean military, who killed up to 10% of the population of Jeju. Eventually, the election took place, and, being boycotted by opponents, Syngman Rhee, who was backed by the US, emerged victorious and soon gave himself dictatorial powers. This was the tumultuous situation into which John Taeil was born. Chun Tae was born September 28, 1948, in Daegu, Gyeongsang Province, as the oldest of two sons and two daughters. He was the eldest son of Chun Sang Su, a poor laborer and tailor from Daegu, and his wife, Yi So Sun, whose father had been an independence fighter during the colonial period and had been killed by the Japanese authorities. At the age of 13, Yi So Sun had been taken by Japanese authorities as part of their forced labor program and worked in a factory that manufactured uniforms. So he came from a very poor, underprivileged family background, but this was also sadly a rather common background during these times. Chen Tae grew up during a time that was generally filled with extreme hardship and suffering for most Koreans. Korea had been liberated from Japanese colonial rule for only about three years when Chun was born, and by that time, the Korean peninsula had been carved up along the 38th parallel into the north and the south. There was extreme chaos with power struggles all across the peninsula, and this was only exacerbated by the ensuing Cold War tensions and the direct interventions of the U.S. and Soviet Union. And on June 25, 1950, the Korean War broke out, which subsequently plunged the entire country into great poverty, violence, and suffering. Violent conflicts had begun to erupt at the border between the North and South, which eventually developed into the Korean War after North Korean troops crossed the 38th parallel in an attempt to reunify the country. Now, this is typically referred to as a North Korean invasion of the South, for example, by places like the British Imperial War Museum. Although I kind of have the feeling that if, say, Southern Britain had been occupied by Germany after World War II, who then set up a puppet government, British troops from the North trying to kick out the Germans wouldn't be described as an invading force by that same museum. But anyway... After initially overrunning much of the South, the UN, led by the US, backing the Rhee regime, was eventually successful in pushing North Korean troops back to the 38th parallel, leaving 5 million dead, mostly civilians, and leaving the Korean peninsula divided as it was before, into North and South. One year after the armistice was signed in 1953, his family had moved to the capital of Seoul when Jun was about six years old. And this was fairly similar to the migration patterns of most people after the war who moved to urban centers to try and find work. But in Seoul, his family experienced homelessness. Um, They had lived under a bridge for most of their first year there and had to frequently resort to begging. And they only really managed to survive because Yi So-san sold food in the streets. His father eventually found a job doing sewing work and they were able to find a small room to live. Um, in a slum in the Itaewon district, 
But because of Park jung earlier slum clearance programs, their home was demolished and they were eventually forced to return to their hometown of Daegu. Park jung was a military officer, allegedly the son of a wealthy collaborator with the Japanese, who became president in 1961. More on him in a moment. For Jun, this meant that he was forced to leave school and do sewing work by his father. And their family's poverty ultimately caused them to split up, with John taking charge of his brother and youngest sister and then going up to Seoul later on. So in a lot of ways, I think John's life is inextricably intertwined with modern Korean history and the war and colonialism. The re-dictatorship was overthrown by a mass movement in the April Revolution of 1960, ushering in a brief window of democracy. But conditions for working class families like that of Lee So Sun remained extremely difficult. To put it simply, things were generally awful for workers in the 1960s, um, pretty much for everyone. The Korean War caused immense devastation, and in the immediate post-war years, the DPRK, or North Korea, was actually better off economically in some ways than the South. And not only that, you had Syngman Rhee, who was the president during the war, who was highly corrupt, um, growing increasingly dictatorial, especially in his anti-communist actions. With the April 19th revolution in 1960, Singman Rhee resigned and was replaced briefly by Yoon Bo-sun. But on May 16, 1961, Park Chung-hee staged a military coup and then ushered in a new era of what's commonly thought to be a developmentalist military dictatorship. And he would go on to restructure South Korean society along highly militaristic lines that focused on industrialization. For workers, there was... Theoretically, the Labor Standards Law, or the Kunmo Kijunbap, which had been enacted in 1953 and was supposed to protect workers' rights. But this was really no more than a translation of a similar law that had been imposed previously by the U.S. military government in Japan. The Labor Standards Law was supposed to limit working hours to eight hours a day, six days a week, with mandatory rest times of 30 minutes every four hours of work. Like most Korean laws, it was written in Chinese characters, which many Korean people, especially amongst the working class and poor, were unable to read. And under a military dictatorship that prioritized economic development, um, none of these laws, as you might have guessed, was followed. The Korean War, I think, also critically influenced the situation for laborers in that the growing anti-communism after liberation, which was formalized and institutionalized through the state, was used to justify suppression of workers or really any kind of dissident voices. The two goals of Park Jung-hee's government could then probably be summarized as the elimination of any kind of leftist elements in the country and the creation and revitalization of a national economy. And this emphasis on economic growth was dependent upon the control and exploitation of a precarious labor force so that any opposition or pro-labor stance would then also be classified as communist. So the anti-communism of the Cold War and suppression of labor rights started to kind of merge in this immediate post-war period. And then what this meant in the labor sphere specifically was that there were two strands of trade unionism in Korea at the time. One was represented by the Federation of Korean Trade Unions, or FKTU, which is the kind of like national umbrella organization for all unions. But their leaders were always appointed either directly by the military government or by the managers of individual companies. So not very sympathetic to the plight of everyday workers. And then the other strand in Korean labor unionism at the time was the democratic trade union movement. So the more informal, um, unofficial and kind of grassroots movements that consisted of mainly branch unions and textiles, electronics and the garment sectors. And. This, I think, was a curious time in that women's participation in the labor force also increased quite significantly. So this trend had started during the Korean War, where, like a lot of other countries during wartime, the women began entering the labor force in large numbers to make up for the men who had gone to battle. But I don't think this trend stopped after the ceasefire. So the proportion of women in the labor force kept increasing across the decade. So around 29% in 1960, 35% in 1970, and then 37% approximately in 1980. For women, they mostly worked in agricultural production, industrial manufacturing, but they were excluded from the most capital-intensive industries, such as shipbuilding, chemical and automobiles, and they didn't have any access to vocational training. 
So by the 1970s then, women comprised about 55% of the workforce in electronics, 72% in textiles, and 52% in rubber footwear. And these industries accounted for almost two-thirds of South Korea's exports during the early 1970s. Um, so basically, women were only able to enter labor-intensive industries marked by insecure employment, um, low skill levels, and low wages. And a lot of these women were also from the countryside, so there was a high rate of rural to urban migration during this time. So, you know, with all these conditions, exploitation was almost inevitable and conditions were atrocious. But I think especially so for women who are oppressed both under capitalism, but then under patriarchy as well. Um, holding education levels constant, women workers in manufacturing received about 56% of the wages paid to their male counterparts. And these young women migrants then just became a part of this rising proletariat class in South Korea's industrializing economy. And they created an easy and kind of abundant supply of cheap and exploitable industrial labor. But this also kind of worked with an extra mindset where daughters were then kind of used by their families for profit. So families would often send daughters to work in a factory somewhere and then use those wages to send their sons to schools or maybe prioritize their sons in ways that daughters were not allowed. So this is the general situation Jean Tao found himself in as he began his working life. South Korea, like the North, was a very, quote, underdeveloped country at this point, and so the government wanted to rapidly industrialise to grow the economy at the expense of super-exploited industrial workers who could be crushed by the military dictatorship if they complained. So when he was in Seoul, Jun did a variety of work, peddling newspapers, polishing shoes, and so on, and then he finally started to work as a sewing assistant at the Seoul Pyeongwha Shijang, or the Seoul Peace Market, with the sewing skills that he had learned from his father. And then when he turned 17, he was promoted to a shida, or a helper, of the sewing machinists and garment cutters at the sweatshops there. I think also, um, perhaps this is revealing of Jung's character and what he was like, is that there are a lot of stories that mention how he spent most of his wages, um, you know, a pittance anyways, but he would spend most of his wages either helping out his family, taking care of his younger siblings, but then also later on when he was at the sweatshop, he spent a significant amount of money just trying to help the poor young woman workers there with things like buying them medicine, buying them food. Um, and so I think in a way, um, though he was so young, we have a really good glimpse of what kind of person he was. A Christian, John often spent his bus fare on food for his colleagues who worked through their lunch breaks hungry, and instead walked his three-hour journey back home on foot. Sometimes on the way, he'd get caught by military curfews and have to spend the night sleeping at a police station. But he came to realise that individual acts of generosity like this weren't enough. Seeing the extreme suffering of those he worked with, mostly young girls, he made a resolution. In this horrible world, where human beings are stripped of all that is human, I will never compromise with any iniquity. I will not remain silent before any injustice, but pay heed and work to rectify it. Chen tells words here are voiced by another member of the Hung Coalition. So going back to Jun, um, after he started working as a tailor, he started to more closely witness the awful working conditions in the Seoul Peace Market. In particular, he was moved to action after seeing how the young female workers there were treated. In an entry from his diary, he notes that workplaces were no bigger than 8 pyong, which is about 4.5 square meters, with about 32 workers crammed into a tiny room. So workers had no room to stretch whatsoever while performing extremely physically taxing work for hours with no rest. Um, there were chemicals everywhere. There was um, extreme dust that was very toxic to breathe in. And 85 to 90 percent of those employed in the peace market were women, with around 60 percent of them between the ages of 14 to 24. Um, they would sometimes work up to 16 hours a day, would be lucky to have like one or two days off a month, and earn less than $30, um, with most of them ultimately suffering from diseases such as tuberculosis and ulcers. So Chante saw this, and he was very understandably horrified. 
And he discovered eventually in 1968 the labor standards law and started educating himself about it. This led him to form the first labor union in the Pyeongwa market called the Pabohe, or Society of Fools, in 1969, which aimed to inform workers about the flaw and the unlawful conditions they were working in and advocated for workers' rights, such as in eight-hour work days and days off. Um, he eventually lost his job for his organizing activities, but he later returned to the same market and started working again as a garment cutter. And this will lead him to create yet another union, this time called the Samdonghui, or the Samdong, this three-building gathering. The name Society of Fools had a couple of meanings. One being their view that garment workers up to that point had accepted being treated like machines rather than humans in silence, like fools. And another being that a senior garment worker, hearing that John Tao wanted to set up a union, called him a fool, to which he responded, so be it. The tool John Teil first decided to use in his organising efforts is one which I personally have used on many occasions at work, as I'm sure is the case for lots of our listeners as well. Probably unknown to John Teil was that it was also a tool used by pioneering communist Karl Marx in the late 19th century, a workers' survey. Apart from working on education and general awareness about workers' conditions, John and his comrades conducted... Um, admittedly a rudimentary survey of workers in the textile sweatshops there, but it was the first of its kind. They created and disseminated questionnaires to the workers and then submitted the findings along with a signed statement to the labor office asking for a change in working conditions. And then throughout this time, they also continuously led protests and agitated for change. Um, They would petition various institutions such as the Ministry of Labor, the City of Seoul, and the mass media. Um, The survey, I mean, it was the first of any kind and the first time anyone, I think, demonstrated a desire to listen to workers and to try and have their voices publicized. Moving from a survey to action would have been extremely difficult. As Rachel outlined, the main union federation, the FKTU, was run by the government and generally more concerned with preventing wildcat strikes and rooting out agitators than advancing the interests of workers. On top of that, the Park regime had set up a huge secret police force, the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, KCIA, which wasn't only concerned with national security, but also with protecting business interests. They sent hundreds of agents into factories to uncover workplace militants. Employers could also rely on state police and privately hired thugs to persecute activists. Independent union organisation then could only happen outside the law, and a web of other restrictive laws made organising strikes effectively illegal, even though they were technically legal. So, for example, strikes could only be held three months after the start of a dispute, and the government could order a strike to end at any point. Despite all this, John Taylor continued to try to organise. In addition to his gruelling work schedule, his long commute and his activism, he also somehow found the time to develop a detailed plan for a humane garment enterprise one run cooperatively by its workers. He put together a 25-page document sketching out how it could work. It would consist of 50 sewing machines run by 157 workers and will cost about $30,000 to set up. He got fired a couple of times from different jobs in the garment industry for his organising efforts and ended up working as a construction labourer while still trying to agitate on behalf of garment workers. And, being a poor worker, he was unable to raise the necessary start-up capital for his cooperative. Employers and the government ignored his survey results, despite the terrible conditions for workers it exposed and the breaches of the labour standards law. And with his unionisation and cooperative efforts proving fruitless, at some point he decided to take drastic action. This is the entry from his diary, dated the 9th of August 1970. How much time have I spent hesitating and agonising after initially making my decision? At this moment, I am almost perfectly determined. I must die. I absolutely must die. To return to the sides of my poor comrades, to the hometown of my heart, to those young innocents of Pyeonghwa Market who formed the entirety of my ideals, I, who have vowed to lay down my life in those endless stretches of time and daydreams, must die to join those fragile beings that need my protection and care. I must throw myself away. I must destroy myself. Just wait and hold on a little longer so that I will never leave your sides. I devote the entirety of myself, weak as I am, to you 
It is all of you that are the hometown of my heart. Today is Saturday, the second Saturday of August, the day I have resolved my heart. In this moment when innocent lives are withering, O Heavenly Father, please grant me your mercy and compassion so that I may become a single drop of dew. Chun at this time had become really discouraged by the government and society's apathy towards workers despite all his efforts and how this was just resulting in increasing control of factory owners over sweatshop workers. And he was also discouraged by a lot of internal strife within these unions themselves because, um, you know, organizing is hard work and there were inevitably a lot of conflicts between people. Um, and so at a public demonstration on November 13th, 1970, um, one that John and his comrades had planned, they had aimed to burn a copy of the country's labor standards law as this kind of symbolic protest against the working condition and the government's neglect. Um, basically saying that, look at this law, it's really just letters on a piece of paper. And yet this protest plan had been leaked to the police and factory owners. And so they prevented a lot of workers from attending and the police had already sworn to protest site so that anyone who did manage to come were separated and then directed back to the factories. And so on the brink of the protest failure, John ended up pouring the flammable paint thinner that had been planned for the event over his own body and set himself on fire. He then ran through the streets yelling, abide by the labor standards law. Um, Workers are not machines and do not let my death be in vain. Words that have since then become immortalized um, and very well known throughout South Korea. Um, And allegedly a copy of the labor standards law had been thrown onto his burning body. And so in a very dark and morbid way, The original plan to burn the law had been accomplished. Um, He was then rushed to a hospital, but died about nine hours later, um, surrounded by his mother and his friends. And he was only 22 years old at the time of his death. At this time, Chun Tae-il's suicide was the first such protest suicide connected with the workers' movement in South Korea. It had a huge and immediate impact around the country. However, it's extremely important to point out that since then, there have been significant numbers of other suicides in South Korea for similar reasons, and none of them have led to any kind of resulting social change. We're going to talk more about this later, but that's really important to bear in mind. Broadly speaking... Chun Tae's death unified a series of disparate groups and solidified a lot of the alliances that would prove crucial to the later democratization movements in the 1980s. So a lot of students actually, um, they felt ashamed and guilty in light of the fact that Jun had really wanted to receive higher education and he had expressed a desire for university friends that could help him with the classical Chinese characters that were Um, necessary to understand the labor laws. So five days after his death, um, 200 students from the Commerce Department at Seoul National University, um, one of the most prestigious universities in Korea, had staged a hunger strike and demanded improved working conditions and vowed to support workers. And then on November 20th, um, students at major universities such as Seoul National, Ihua, Korea University, and Yonsei They organized a rally to commemorate his death and adopted a resolution stating that they would establish their own like truth or fact-finding commission regarding the working conditions of laborers. This all led to a closer alliance between the students or intellectuals, workers, and Christian organizations, as Christian organizations were spaces where these students or intellectuals could most easily meet workers and also find programs that had already been set up for them. So one example is the Urban Industrial Mission in the 1970s, which was an interdenominational ministry created in the late 1950s to spread the gospel to the workers. But after John's death, um, from 1972 to 1979, the Urban Industrial Missions, um, their purpose kind of shifted to become more of 
the awakening or enlightenment of workers. So education and reaching out to workers really became a crucial tenet of the 1970s. And um, the pedagogy of the oppressed was actually a very widely circulated text during this time within social movement groups. Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Brazilian educator Paulo Freire was published in 1968 and quickly became extremely influential. Freire was writing from a socialist perspective of someone involved in grassroots efforts to teach adult literacy and working class communities and advocated upending the traditional relationship between student and teacher. So rather than a teacher being someone to simply bestow information on a student, teaching should begin by coming together with the understanding that both have things to teach and learn from each other. Jen's death, I think, also became the catalyst for transforming night schools from just a kind of regular supplementary school system to a place for conscious social movement that engaged in um, social issues and political education. And then for the workers themselves, one of the most immediate after effects was the 1970 peace market protest, which was directly sparked by Jen's death. And then until then, most of the women workers in the sweatshops there had been um, quite understandably preoccupied with mere survival and had perceived themselves primarily as individuals rather than belonging to a larger group of workers or having this kind of class consciousness. So two weeks after Jen's death, um, these women workers formed the Chungye Garment Workers Union at the Peace Market. And with increased pressure on the government and public awareness of um, caused by Jen's death, this union was actually soon officially recognized. One of the people who was involved in the establishment of the Chongye Garment Workers Union was John Tail's mother, Lee So Sun. Cho Young Ne, the author of um, a biography by, of John Tail, noted that John had requested that his mother carry out what he had failed to do at his deathbed. While John was alive, she had been pretty apathetic and rather hesitant about Jen's organizing activities because from the position of a mother, um, she was understandably concerned about his safety. But after his death, um, she really took his words to heart and became an organizer herself and directly involved in the labor movement. Um, in fact, I actually think Yi so san was just as critical to the labor movement, if not more, than Chen Tae-yu. And that the difference in the ways that Chen and Lee are remembered, so... That is, Chun is widely celebrated, um, and there are all sorts of memorials for him. But Yi so san while she is also equally well-regarded, she's often frequently referred to as Chun Tae's mother, or always his mother, something in relation to him, despite her activism in her own right. And this sort of speaks to the kind of ways that patriarchy can sometimes operate and has left its lasting legacy on the labor movement. Um, but to kind of go back to what happened right after his death, um, the Park jung government had offered to pay 70 million won in compensation for Jen's death to his mother, which was an enormous sum at the time. However, she refused the money and the funeral offered by the state and instead asked them to demonstrate their goodwill to all the workers and not solely to the family of Chen Tae. She presented um, the delegation with a list of eight conditions that reflected her son's wishes, such as creating a trade union in the peace market, um, reducing the work hours to eight hours, um, every Sunday off, health checks, um, adequate ventilation in the buildings. And then barely a week after her son's funeral, she officiated the ceremony marking the formation of the Chungye Garment Workers Union, which was the first democratic union in Korea. The section of the exhibition I visited about Lee So-sun after John's death was absolutely heartbreaking. In particular, it contains a photograph of her at her son's funeral, clutching a photograph of him with a look just of incredible anguish. Her story made me think of the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina. Mothers of mostly left-wing anarchist and radical workers disappeared by the military dictatorship. They demonstrated outside the presidential palace every week, never giving up the idea of getting justice for their murdered children. John Tail probably couldn't have imagined just how much Lee So Sun would take his words to heart and continue his fight. This is my speculation, but because Chen Tae had was such a deep lover of education and learning, but had always been denied any kind of opportunity to pursue it in a formal way because of poverty, Yi So Sun also greatly emphasized education in her organizing activities. Um, 
in an interview with Tim Sharp that he generously shared with me, she mentioned that after I was released from prison, I thought about what I should do for the workers. My conclusion, nothing else but educational work to recover what the workers lost with severe sacrifices. Support for a classroom is the best way to support the Korean workers movement. It is not just for me or for the peace market workers, but for all Korean workers against the government and the enterprises. And so to that end, she was crucial in setting up educational programs for workers, which included both vocational and basic academic courses, as well as instruction in trade unionism and labor law. She served as director of the laborers classroom, um, also sometimes translated as workers classroom, which is a school and center for young textile workers. In 1971, the Chungye Union also organized a canteen at the peace market that provided free lunches daily to approximately 500 workers. Um, But as I mentioned, the 1970s was a really difficult time for anyone even remotely anti-government. This peace market canteen was closed down because it was accused of being a front for pro-communist propaganda. And the government continuously attempted to bully and coerce the Chungye Union, um, particularly in shutting down their education programs. And so Lee so Sun would protest this, and on February 1975, she had led a sit-in strike with about 250 workers to protest against the government's constant interference. On July 1977, about two years after, she was arrested and the labor education building that was rented by the Chungye Union was raided by the police and finally shut down. She ended up spending about 14 months in solitary confinement in Suwon Women's Prison. And while she was there, opposition to Park jung increasingly dictatorial regime grew. As well as the formation of the Chongye Garment Workers Union, an autonomous movement of South Korean workers, particularly women workers, began to reemerge. The peace market protests were also, I think, a vital catalyst for the South Korean labor movement, which had been suppressed by the developmental regime and the tight union between um, state and national labor unions. And this started a kind of more public questioning of who this economic growth was precisely for in this supposedly booming economy. Uh, For me, though, I think it's most interesting that even though the 1970s is seen as this this dark period because of the Yushin Constitution, which had been passed by Park Jung-hee's government and pretty much established him as a dictator president for life, Um, It was also a time where organizing activity by women greatly increased. There was this intersection of what um, scholar Sung Sung Moon has called a militarized masculinity. So the militarization of society, which had increased the state's power and reach into its citizen lives and then carved out these very specific gender roles for men and women along patriarchal lines. And along with that, there was this stringent anti-communism used to prosecute any kind of labor organizing activity, and then an alliance between the state and national labor unions, such as the FKTU, or the Federation of Korean Trade Unions, that sought to just crush any kind of local grassroots unions or organizing activities. And yet, despite the tremendous risk that laborers faced, um, especially women laborers, It was precisely the 1970s that witnessed all these pretty much momentous events. Um, In fact, from the mid-1970s to the mid-1980s, a greater proportion of women belonged to labor unions than men. Uh, Some of the more famous unions formed mostly by women workers during this time included the unions at Soyo Enterprise, uh, Wenpeng Textile, Control Data, Tongyu Textile, Namhua Electric, Seo Trading, and YH Trading. So Korean women, in other words, were at the forefront of establishing autonomous grassroots unions in the 1970s and paving the way for future democratic trade unions in South Korea. Um, This history is perhaps not so widely known or talked about, but I think it is very important and it counters a lot of the stereotypical images that people may have um, both at the time and a little bit now, but the stereotype of Asian women as being somehow inherently passive or weak or that, you know, Asian cultures are somehow more amenable to being controlled by authority. Um, 
I think, for instance, on February 1972, you had the Tonya Textile Company, which elected a woman leader, the first woman to take over an already established union. And on April 15, 1974, a woman led the formation of a branch union at the Pando Textile Company. And then just a year later, you also had the creation of another union at the YH Wig and Garment Company. And then so from 1976 to 1980, you had the Tonya Textile Strikes and the 1979, the YH Trading Strike, which were all primarily led again by women. Um, but here, I think it's also worth mentioning the brutal sexual violence that many of these women laborers were also subjected to as intimidation tactics. So these acts would include, but not limited to, stripping, fondling, threat of rape, and rape itself. Um, this was used both as a way to control women's work, so to keep them in line and pr as productive workers, but then also as a way to discourage any organizing activities. And it also wasn't just limited to the male bosses in the company or other male workers. Um, riot squads and policemen will later use sexual assault and labor disputes at the Chungye Textile Union in 1976 the Tonga Textile Company in 1978, and the YH Trading Company in 1979. There were also practices of, these more insidious practices of spreading rumors that a woman worker was, you know, not a virgin or that she was doing something that people might have found scandalous to kind of further inflict social ostracism. And this would similarly compound the silence and suffering of victims of sexual violence. Some union leaderships also use similar tactics against rank-and-file workers' organising efforts. For example, at the Dongil Textile Company in 1978, the head of the National Textile Workers' Union sent around 200 thugs to attack women workers who were voting in union elections, smashing the ballot boxes and smearing the women with faeces. These disputes by women workers sparked further protests and events which contributed to the downfall of the park dictatorship. Park Jung-hee was eventually assassinated in 1979, but Chun Duan quickly ascended to power and brought in another military dictator regime in 1980. His government basically destroyed almost every single independent trade union. Um, they would rewrite the South Korea's labor law to forbid third-party intervention and then would strip industrial unions of their power as well. The government also reorganized the Federation of Korean Trade Unions, um, and many leading figures were expelled from the labor movements. I believe formal union membership at this time drastically dropped from about 1.2 million members in 1980 to less than 800,000 by 1983, 1985-ish. Um, and then in the 1980s, with this new dictatorship, women workers particularly struggled because South Korea started to move away from the light manufacturing industries they were in to more heavy chemical and manufacturing industries, such as steel, auto, and shipbuilding which were mostly comprised of male workers. And then simultaneously, trade unions shifted from being these autonomous grassroots unions like the Chungye Union to large enterprise unions controlled by male leadership, um, such as the FKTU, which was essentially just a government organ that would pass government policies down to national level unions. And so despite all this, Yi so Sun continued to serve as a vocal advocate and ardent organizer, along with many others across South Korea. In 1980, you had the Gwangju uprising. Um, but in 1987, a crucial year where many underground unions developed, there was also the June Democratic Struggle that was a nationwide democracy movement in South Korea that created just massive protests for, um, for weeks in June and eventually succeeded in forcing the ruling government to hold elections and other democratic reforms. So her activism, I think, can be seen as kind of part and partial of this larger stream of organizing and democratization movements that were going on in Korea during this time. We're currently working on an episode about the Gwangju uprising and have a couple of interviews with people who took part in it. So do make sure to subscribe so you don't miss that. The Gwangju uprising followed other uprisings in Busan and Masan in 1979, and just a few years later came the June Democratic Struggle in 1987. This was sparked by the killing of a student demonstrator who was tortured to death by police. 
as well as the police sexual assault of a woman labour organiser from Seoul. The fall of the dictatorship was quickly followed by a massive, unprecedented strike wave called the Great Worker Struggle. It involved up to 1.2 million workers. That's a third of the regularly employed workforce. It affected most major industries, and it won significant increases to paying conditions. Lee So Sung continued her activism through this period, until the end of her life. Lee So Sung passed away at the age of 82 on September 3, 2011. Because of her frequently repeated phrase, where she would say, every worker is my son now, she earned the title of mother or amoni from a lot of workers. I have slightly mixed feelings about this because I do believe, you know, we should see women as just beyond their ability to be mothers or daughters or wives. But um, I do think it is a term that indicates the high respect and regard that many people had for her, especially laborers, and a recognition of her efforts on their behalf. Um, And she was very active. I mean, she died in an old age, but even up until her death, she continued fighting for workers, um, and not just laborers, but the rights of really all those that were marginalized in society. Lisa Sun was also a vocal advocate for irregular workers, casual workers who were often sidelined by the regular labor movement. She also co-founded and helped lead the Association of Bereaved Families for Democracy, a group run by relatives of those killed in the pro-democracy movement. And she was also a participant in the People's Movement Coalition for Democracy and Reunification in the 1980s. Despite her central role in the South Korean working class movement, and the fact she was involved for so many decades, Lee so is not nearly as well known as her son. Just walking around in Seoul, my friends and I happened upon a statue of Jun Tae-il by the peace market. And when I asked a couple of non-activist Korean friends, both of them had heard of Jun Tae-il and were aware that he was a labour movement martyr. But neither of them had heard of Lee so Sun by name but she was the subject of a documentary in 2012. And the title of the documentary is Aboni, which is mother. So I think, you know, this kind of remembering is not just limited to individuals, but it is kind of promoted on like a mass kind of wider cultural scale too. And, you know, I have mixed feelings about it, um, but um, hopefully we're kind of moving in a different direction and, Someday we'll have a statue of Lee Sun. One thing we mentioned earlier briefly, we need to look at again in a bit more detail. This is the question of protest suicide. We've spoken about Jun Tae-il and his suicide and spoken about positive social outcomes that it had. However, it is really, really important to point out that this doesn't mean that this is a good tactic or one which is ever worth anyone repeating. As we said earlier, in South Korea at the time, this was the first such suicide of its kind. And as such, it had more of an impact on public opinion than any subsequent suicides. Since Jun Tae-il, over a hundred other South Korean people have killed themselves as some sort of protest, none of them inspiring anything similar. And elsewhere around the world, many hundreds of people have done the same thing, mostly to no effect. One slight exception to this could be the self-immolation of Mohamed Bouazizi in Tunisia, which sparked the 2011 revolution and the Arab Spring. But again, this was a fluke. Since then, hundreds of people in Tunisia alone have set fire to themselves as a form of protest, with nothing resulting from it. Similarly, in the UK, numerous people have killed themselves due to austerity programmes, particularly cuts to sickness and unemployment benefits, mostly out of despair rather than protest as such. But again, this did not result in any sort of widespread sympathy for the unemployed or disabled people, let alone any positive changes. It's impossible to tell if history could have happened differently, if different things had happened. For example, it's quite possible that some other sequence of events could have sparked the growth of the workers' movement in South Korea at that time. Jun Tae-il himself may have even managed to go on to have concrete successes with organising if he had not died at such a young age. For most people, this stuff probably goes without saying. However, because so many people suffer from mental ill health, especially in the times we're in now, and because suicide is something which can be contagious, we just think it's really important to spell out that if you want a better world, We really need you to stay in it and fight with us. Suicide is never a good idea from a social change perspective. And anyone thinking seriously of suicide should please speak to a mental health professional. Going back to Lee So Sun and Chantel, as a final question, I asked Rachel what she thought their legacy was today. 
This is my personal view, but I think that Chante and Iso Sun's legacy presses us to grapple with the complicated ways in which gender, labor, and social movements intersect. In contemporary South Korean society, I think it's pretty safe to say that Jun is almost universally beloved or respected unless you belong to a chebel or a conglomerate and are part of the super wealthy elite. A Chebo is a big, normally family-owned industrial conglomerate in South Korea, Samsung and LG being particularly famous ones. Interestingly, both of those electronics companies were in the textile industry back in the 60s. But at the same time, I would like to encourage people to question why it's easier to remember and commemorate Chan Tae-yu than these countless women factory workers, or the other nameless individuals that similarly lost their lives in the labor and democratization movements in subsequent years. So why, in other words, is it easier to celebrate individuals and martyrs than to think about collectives and the messy work that goes into building them? This is a really good question. We're partly guilty of this here because we've made a podcast episode specifically about Jun Tail and Lee Sun. We also touch on this same question in our first podcast episode about the Grunwick strike of East African Asian women workers in London in the 1970s. That was very much a collective struggle, but often the media and some historians like to portray history as a story of great men, or occasionally women, and the Grunwick strike is often portrayed as being led by one person. Whereas in reality, as in any industrial dispute or big struggle, it's the mass participation of large numbers of people which is key to whether we win or lose. So not wanting to make excuses as such, we decided to name this episode as we did, basically because John Taylor is a famous figure, and so people are more likely to find this through a search engine than something more abstract. Also, he and Lee So's son aren't so connected to one specific strike or dispute which we could name the episode after instead. Hopefully though it's clear from how Rachel's told the story that they were just two participants in a much bigger story about large numbers of mostly women textile and garment workers. In general, though, it is important that we think about how we can tell stories about kind of unnamed masses of people rather than just a few prominent individuals. As a small point of information, Rachel's about to mention Kijijon workers. These were sex workers or comfort women located near U.S. military camps. Those in leftist spaces, I believe there's also kind of a tendency to have a fixed and romanticized image of the struggling factory, farm, or industrial worker um, who is often male. And so what is the kind of implicit moralizing that we do when we limit our definition of labor and laborers? Um, for instance, we might think of the Kijichong workers or the, the U.S. military campdown um, sex workers at this time who were um, left out of any kind of these sort of labor movements. Simultaneously, John reminds us that individual actions do matter and can have profound effects that none of us can really ever predict. Uh, for me, I think it's John's motivations for his actions that I find most compelling. He was moved to action by seeing the suffering of these young girls working under atrocious conditions, of seeing those that were just utterly abandoned by society that no one ever really cared about. And I think a lot about his initial motivation in the context of South Korea today, um, of the migrant workers who are currently stranded and unable to get home because of the coronavirus pandemic, who are constantly subject to precarious and ever-changing immigration laws that only value them for the profit that they can produce. Um, I think, again, about these U.S. military camptown workers or the other currently um, any kind of sex workers right now in Korea who are have so little protection from the law or really any sympathy from a lot of society. I think about then the marriage migrants who are left vulnerable. They face abuse and um, are just isolated in this newfound society to them. Uh, my really good friend Anton once said something that I love, which is that more than K-pop or Samsung, South Korea's true legacy is mass resistance. Um, from the March 1st movement in 1919 to the more recent candlelight protests, South Korea has had a very vibrant civil society and protest culture. 
And so it's my hope that in the continuation of such a legacy in this age of neoliberal capitalism and globalization, that we look beyond the borders of the Korean Peninsula and also kind of embrace a more transnational solidarity with all the marginalized and oppressed people of the world. I think that in the end, this kind of activity would most accurately reflect the spirit of Chantei and Iso Sun's struggles and honor them. concludes the main section of these episodes. However, we did also speak to Rachel a bit more about the Hung Coalition and their work. So Hung Coalition is this collective that I'm a part of, comprised of researchers, grad students, organizers, translators. Um, We're both in and outside the Korean diaspora and South Korea itself. And we mostly got together because we were really unhappy with the way Korea is frequently discussed. in media and academia, just in a broader sense, and how it's often reduced to this object of study, which is, you know, historically tied to very specific political intentions, whether on behalf of the the U.S. or um, Japan colonial period, as well as this kind of ethnic nationalism that seems really pervasive among the diaspora right now. So we just wanted to create a space for more nuanced discussions and maybe confront how meaning making around Korea has been conducted through our own writing, translations, and various events and organizing. Um, you can find out more about us on our website, which is hungcoalition.com or H-E-U-N-G-C-O-A-L-I-T-I-O-N or on Twitter, again, at Home Coalition. And we will pop links to those in the show notes on our website. As well as Hung, Rachel told us about some other groups organizing on the ground in South Korea right now. I want to shout out two organizations in particular. One is the Guljan Bijongyu Nodongja Shinta. Um, in English, it translates roughly to Sound Sleep or a Shelter and Rest Center for Irregular Workers. So this is a center that was built in Seoul, and it is aimed for irregular workers who are, um, you know, who may be out of work, who may have gotten fired for any kind of protest activities, um, but really just expanded to any kind of workers in precarious conditions. Um, It's aim to provide a place for them to sleep and rest and to kind of have a place to stay, um, um, basically kind of a shelter of some short sorts. And um, the website link that I did send you is all in Korean, but I think they're doing a lot of important work, especially right now when um, given the economic precarity of caused by the coronavirus pandemic, but then also the necessity of, you know, sheltering in place and staying inside and so on. Um, and another organization I also wanted to mention is the Changye Yosong Gongam, um, the Women with Disabilities Empathy Group. Um, they're not, I suppose, specifically tied to laborers or workers, but they're an organization that's dedicated to promoting awareness and providing support for women with disabilities in South Korea. And in the sense that we should sort of address all the kinds of ways that any form of discrimination and marginalization manifest, I think they're doing incredibly important work for a group of people that often get overlooked in South Korean society. Um, There's still not too much awareness regarding disabilities in South Korea. And so um, I do think, you know, in the same way that Chante was inspired by the young female workers in the factories, I think that it's important for us to also expand um, who we care about and who we take care of in these times. to those that we might not immediately see or know about. 
We've put links to these organizations on the webpage for this episode, link in the show notes. We've also got all of our sources, more information and links to further reading on the webpage for this episode. Again, link in the show notes. In our online store, we've got a great book about South Korean history called Asia's Unknown Uprisings, Volume 1 by George Katsiofikis. And you can get 10% off that as well as anything else in your next order from our online store using the discount code WCH Podcast. As always, huge, huge thanks to our Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider joining us on Patreon, where you can get exclusive early access to episodes, bonus episodes, free books, posters, and more. Learn more and sign up at patreon.com slash working class history. Link in the show notes. Special thanks to Connor Kanatsi, Shay, Anal Scuba Hive, James, and Ariel Joya. If you can't spare the cash, absolutely no worries. Please just tell your friends and family about our podcast and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your favourite podcast app. Big thanks also to Rachel Min Park and the Hung Coalition for their assistance with this episode. The music for this episode was Marching for the Beloved about the Gwangju Uprising by Beek Ki Wang, Huang Suk Young and Kim Jong Ryul. Link to stream it in the show notes. Thanks to Jesse French for editing this episode. And finally, thanks to you for listening. Catch you next time. Oh, my God.